Greetings and welcome to No BS Baking. You've got JP here. Today I want to properly explain the benefits of using malt in your recipe. And importantly, the difference between diastatic and non-diastatic malt. So without further ado, let's get into it. Malt is commercially available in syrup, powder and extracts. And a small amount added to your recipe can provide numerous baking benefits spanning improvements in yeast performance, nicer internal texture, and even shelf life enhancement. So let's start with diastatic malt, which in simple terms is basically enzyme active malt. The most prevalent enzymes and the ones which play a direct role in our baking is amylases. So let's look at this in more detail. In general, wheat flour, beyond its obvious macronutrients such as starch, protein, and other non-starch polysaccharides, it generally contains technologically important enzymes such as amylases, proteases, lipoxygenase, and a few others. You can see that flour contains amylase, so why would we want to add diastatic malt? Well, let's start by just quickly looking at amylase enzymes and understanding their functionality. Amylase enzymes play a critical role in the ability of living organisms to break down carbohydrates into simple sugars so they can be absorbed and metabolized efficiently. The three main types of amylases are alpha amylase, beta amylase, and gamma. Alpha amylase is present in humans, animals, plants, and microbes, whereas beta amylase is primarily found in microbes and plants. Gamma amylase, on the other hand, can be located in both animals and plants. Amylase breaks down starch into a disaccharide called maltose. From this point, bacteria and yeast take over. They contain an enzyme called maltase, which further breaks down the two-molecule disaccharide into a simple saccharide, or more commonly referred to as a simple sugar. Yeast, like humans, need these sugars to be broken down to their lowest common denominator to absorb or feed on them properly. In humans, the bacterial microbes in the small intestine provide this function. As in the case of yeast, the faster or more efficiently this process happens, the more effective the yeast is. The faster yeast can metabolize the sugar, the more gas production. This equals quicker, more profound rise in baked goods. Malt has a strengthening effect on gluten and overall the whole protein network in the dough. Now this can improve the dough's elasticity and help it retain gas produced during fermentation, leading to a better rise and structure in the final bread. Malt contributes to the browning of the crust, giving the bread an appealing golden color. It also adds subtle sweetness and complexity to the flavor profile of the bread, enhancing its overall taste. Malt has natural preservative properties which can help extend the shelf life of bread by inhibiting the growth of certain microorganisms that can lead to spoilage. Further, malt can improve the moisture retention of the product, providing some additional anti-staling benefits for a softer, more fresh-feeling crumb texture for longer. There are a number of sites that state malt contributes to a higher nutritional profile in the product, as it's rich in enzymes and vitamins. Now, although this is true in theory, and checking with some of the technical resources, the contributions are deemed negligible in the finished product and are often superseded by the perceived negative impact of increased calories it imparts. Both diastatic and non-diastatic malt is commercially available in three main forms, usually powder, syrups, and concentrates. Now, powders is usually the most common one that home bakers prefer to use. It's easy, it's versatile, and it's commonly available everywhere. That being said, there's a number of folks out there that like using syrups. They often impart a bit sweeter and more flavorful contribution. Now, I've seen a number of posts from folks making bagels that prefer syrup over powder for seemingly better finished characteristics. Now, as I cheat about in all my videos, just be cautious when adding syrups, as they do contain water, whereby you may need to make a hydration adjustment to your recipe. Just keep that in mind. 
And lastly, you got concentrates or extracts. Now, obviously, when working with concentrates, you need to have a clear plan for your goals and expectations and measure much more precisely, please. Barley is grown around the world and processed into malt products in many countries. Now, barley is the most commonly malted grain in part because of its high content of enzymes, although wheat, rye, oats, rice, corn, millet, and even some ancient grains like spelt are also used to create malt products. So keep in mind, the range of amylase in a typical malt powder and syrup can vary based on the type of barley used, the geographic location it was grown, and the malting conditions during the production process. Further, with respect to malt syrups, remember they contain varying amounts of water, so it's always good to check your label. However, if in doubt, plan on 20% of the syrup being water as a guideline. Depending on who you ask, where you look, the brand or type of uh, flour that you're using, i.e. whole wheat, rye, ancient wheats, etc., and even basic white flour sold in your region, which can contain supplemented enzymes, maturing agents, or conditioners directly from the mill. Now, it's important to try and understand what's in your flour before arbitrarily just splunking an enzyme active malt based on a particular site or YouTube channel's recommendation. Here are some basic guidelines provided by Bakerpedia that seem to be good ranges and starting points when using enzyme active malt syrup. In case you wondered, you'll note that the whole wheat rolls and bread recommendation is higher than many of the others. Now this is because whole wheat flour contains more bran and germ, which can interfere with the enzyme enzymatic activity during fermentation. So an additional boost is commonly added. These percentages are reflective of malt syrup, so in the event that you opt for powder, seemingly the recommendations out there are to reduce the amount used by 20%. So as an example, if every gram of syrup you add for a recipe, you would use 0.8 of a gram as a guideline for powder. But always check your product, they often give you recommended usages on the package. Using too much enzyme active malt in your product can really speed up the fermentation process to a point that it's just happening a bit too fast. Now this rapid expansion can weaken the structure of the product by excessively breaking down the starches, pounding it full of gas and alcohol at a much faster rate versus a controlled rise and a controlled fermentation process. Some of the common characteristics are sticky weak dough after rise, gooey, almost gelatin-like crumb that is open and erratic in structure, or that same gooey crumb that is dense due to the weakness from over-fermentation. Now, crust color can take on an almost red reddish tinge, and the finished product may be excessively sweet and or carry a stronger than normal aroma of alcohol. And here I just listed the differences between the two types of malt and the benefits you can expect. So after all this, should I run out and get some? From the home baker perspective, I don't know if I would jump to diastatic malt just because. However, now the amount of enzyme present in your flour, as I stated previously, is subject to the milling process. Some millers supplement amylase enzyme to power up the flour, some do not. If the enzymatic activity in my brand of flour is low or poor, then diastatic malt is a nice option. If I wanted a bit more strength and maybe better oven spring in my whole wheat bread or rolls, diastatic malt can help. If I found that fermentation was a bit underwhelming after a long cold bulk rest in my refrigerator, then there's an option to kick up the activity by using diastatic malt. Now if no matter what I do, my product seems a bit pale after baking and I want a deeper, richer browning effect, malt can help. The thing is that many flour millers over the years have been focused on the performance of their product. In many instances, you will see malted barley or amylase or even simpler versions like enzymes on your flour ingredient label. As millers have been shifting away from chemical or chemical sounding uh, names, to more natural label friendly alternatives. So in fact, most likely you got everything you need already in your flour.
And lastly, contrary to what you may read online, the results when using diastatic malt are not always unicorns and rainbows. As an example, analytical comparison by the folks at Breadtopia had mixed results with their sourdough test, and there are more examples of tests where the benefits amounted to nothing to write home to mom about. With this in mind, keep your expectations in check. The final results could be better or not. What works for some bakers in some parts of the world may not work the same for you. Start with a smaller amount first and build it up with a plan in mind. Don't push the fermentation process too fast as there's a fine line between speeding up yeast activity and stressing the internal structure of the dough. Now, dough needs a nice controlled fermentation and final rise, not an explosion of activity.